gonna be a wonderful 70s party. Boy, you see, I got my Converse on. <laughs> We're gonna take it back to the 70s, y'all. Oh, come on, Denise. Happened about two months ago. down the block. Thanks for coming. We also have David Onick coming who is uh, running for uh, district attorney. So when you listen to people, you can make up your, I mean, we're certainly not telling anyone how to vote, but it's certainly important who takes the time to come and speak to disabled medical cannabis patients. We had a few people telling people not to donate to this dinner. It actually made a few people donate more. So um, I'd also like to put out that the pit uh, is where we are receiving all of our barbecue from tonight, and it should be really yummy. <laughs> And I really want to thank Waterfall Wellness for and um, our collective in Hercules for bringing a lot of uh, our harm reduction supplies for tonight. Waiting for the meat to get here. of how many students do we have in the house? How many people are going up to City College, going to state, um, you know? Okay, well, we've got an organization for you guys to join, and it's called Students for Medical Cannabis Protections. And um, we have uh, the co-creators. Sorry, okay, there we go. We have the co-creators of the organization here with us tonight, and one of them indeed is a birthday uh, birthday boy here, uh, Mr. John Gallo. So before he speaks, I'm going to ask someone who can sing, like perhaps, oh geez, I don't know, Marquise can sing, I've heard. Um, anybody else who can sing, just help us sing happy birthday to John Gallo. Happy birthday. My name is Marquis Osby, and um, me and John Gallo are the co-creators of Students for Medical Cannabis Protections. Um, John Gallo is an active student at CCSF, as well as Elise and a couple of other people. I am a returning student, so I am in charge of all the returning students coming back to either CCSF or any other colleges in the state of California. Uh, John Gallo will be over the uh, active students, and we have a new uh, person that will be coming in to be over the international students. The people coming from Japan, from Korea, from South Africa, that come here and get their cannabis cards will be advocating for them as well to be able to have their cannabis on, on campus and to use it on campus in a specific location that the school knows about. Um, another thing is we do not have any representatives from the uh, 
California State Universities, nor the uh, University of California, whether in LA, San Francisco, anywhere. We don't have any representatives. We are looking for representatives. We are in discussions with, uh, what's his name? <laughs> The uh, school board director. Oh, you're talking about John Rizzo. We've been in contact Rizzo. with John Rizzo, thank you. And he is strongly supporting having medical cannabis on campus, but he wants it in a uh, designated known spot by the police officials on campuses and also by the, the faculty leaders of the campuses. Um, I'm going to turn it over to John to give you guys our information and where to find us. At. Okay, I'm John Gell, and like I said, I'm, I'm currently a student at CCSF, and John Rizzo is on... I get no of that. Board of Trustees. He's on the Board of Trustees, and I think he's the... He's on the Board of Trustees. Right. Anyway, um, but no, I met John Rizzo through Deborah Walker, when Deborah Walker was running for District 6 Yay. as um, supervisor. But uh, but now I'm trying to work with Shauna, who's the advisor of the students thing. <laughs> but no, but like I'm saying, we were going, because I read in the um, West Coast paper about the college students were the ones that were being double uh, mammied or double sh uh, web um, sword because it, you know if you're a patient you're legal with you have your paperwork or your card but when you go on to campus because of federal funding it's like a you know so you got like a double jeopardy thing so that's the reason why me and Mark came up with that organization and you can find it on Facebook under students for medical cannabis protection. And that's the vision there. I want to introduce uh, Gregory Ledbetter from Black and Brown Just Cannabis Policies. And if you haven't become a member, you need to. All right, Mr. Ledbetter, tell us what your org is about. Thank you so much. Uh, how are you guys doing? I like what you said, I'm great, but better. I'm the um, uh, one part of the activity here at Action to Love. And also, uh, a while back, uh, I started realizing uh, as I became more and more of a responsible campus patient that there were more and more people of color ending up at age 50 Bryant for medical for cannabis offenses, yeah. I'll take the medical uh, the medi medical part off there. For cannabis offenses, African Americans and people of color, and I mean I'm talking Asian, uh, Black, uh, Asian, Black, uh, Latino, are in filling up the prisons down there at 850 Bryant for minor cannabis offenses. So they're, uh, as that the old fashioned say, uh, saying goes, there ought to be a law. Well, that's how come black and brown just cannabis policy got together. You turn around and be a watchdog for the agencies that decide to go out and chase and mark people of our persuasion to make sure that we are treated fairly and justly. Uh, like Shona said, that the membership for uh, uh, Black and Brown Just Cannabis Policy is open. I encourage you guys to please stop in and apply. Uh, sign up with me. Uh, we will start holding uh, holding meetings on a regular monthly basis. And if you'd like to find out more about what I do and how you can get involved, I am at on Facebook, Black and Brown Just Cannabis Policy as well as bbjcp at net.com. So, thanks you guys. Uh, simple possession charges, uh, smoking, you know, they're, they're using every jam that they can to turn around and get you down there at Heartbreak Ridge. This new sit line uh, ordinance is here for us as well. Why? Because we're low income 
people. We're persons of color. Uh, we're not able to turn around. And some of us may not have a, a place to properly meditate. Uh, and if you are have a, a place, it's probably an SRO. And they have smoking rules and regulations. And once you get on the streets, you're, you're subjected to the, the, the do's and don'ts of SFPD. And believe me, they prefer to do it than not to do it. So, you guys, we all got to get together, we all have to have a voice, and we all have to come correctly to the powers that be to let them know that we are a family, and we are a nation, the cannabis nation, y'all. Uh, as a result of Black and Brown this cannabis policy, we have two candidates that are running for our task force seats up at City Hall right now, uh, running in our elder spot. One of our talented musicians, one of the great friends of mine, and a dear, dear, dear member of our cannabis community, Jonathan Beaver, will be running for our elder seat. A strong, patient advocate, a hard worker, and yes, I'm a little bit partial because he's a good friend of mine, running for the patient's advocacy seat, Marquise Osby. So you guys, I want you to get involved, become active. We're up at City Hall just about every Friday. Uh, third Friday of the month is the best one to be at because it is the task force. It is the collection of all the uh, service providers, uh, club owners, and patient advocates. They're all sitting down at the table to try to write legislation to make your life as well as mine a better place as a patient in a medical cannabis community. Speaking of which, I want to give a big hand to Mr. Gregory Ledbetter. And I don't know if he went through the fact that um, he is also seated on MOOC, which is our lowest enforcement priority for uh, any cannabis arrest. And we have, if you've had a problem or had an incident with the police in which you were treated unfair around cannabis, we have the forms up here. And that oversight body was one of the first pieces of legislation that I worked on at City Hall to create oversight. And it was really important because, you know, at first they wanted the oversight body just to be, you know, sort of lobbyists and national policy orgs and et cetera. And I worked with Tom Amiano to get patient advocates, to get social justice workers, to get harm reduction, and to get someone from the public defender's office. So people that actually uh, have law enforcement encounters to uh, be at the table and help work things out. So please, if you know of anyone who's had encounters with the SFPD that were unfair around cannabis or medical cannabis, we have the forms up there. And part of the problem is that nobody's filling them out because they're scared and you can fill them out anonymously but we do need to start collecting the statistics and um, I also want to let folks know that um, we're going to be uh, really struggling at the task force level to keep patient representation we had kind of a crazy thing happen where we had uh, one of the leaders of the patients union who's here with us tonight James could you stand up Awesome. Patient Union is in the house tonight. And if you want to get involved in the Patient Union, please go talk to James. Um, I don't know if he brought a sign-up sheet, but James made a very simple request to have speaker cards at the Medical Cannabis Task Force, and this caused um, quite a problem with some of the more conservative members. Yes. How many people fill out speaker cards every time they go up to the board? The and what speaker cards do is they account for the public weighing in on the top.
topics that the body is voting on. And it's very important to protect your rights. So please join the patient's union. Find out what's going on. Because if you want access to medical cannabis, unfortunately, in the city of Sanctuary, we're going to have to fight for it. Our current district attorney is our former police chief. And he... of interest? Oh, you think? Yeah. All right. And one of the things that um, that the current uh, DA, who was our former police chief, gives a big and was his crown, was sitting live, which affects every poor person in this city. Even if we have a roof over our head, we do not want to see poor people singled out for arrest for simply being in public spaces. Am I right? some of my, my personal endorsements for our law enforcement seats. And um, district attorney is a really important one. And I would like to introduce everyone to David Onick, who's running for district attorney. Let's give him a big, warm welcome. Thanks so much, uh, everybody. Thank you very much for the introduction. It's really an honor to be here, and uh, what an amazing turnout and an amazing group. Um, I'm running for district attorney uh, because we have a criminal justice system that's completely broken. I usually have a very loud voice, so I think it'll work okay. Um, you know, we have a situation where we're spending so much on our prison system that we nearly bankrupt the state and we can't pay for all the services that we all need to keep people from going to prison in the first place. At the same time, seven out of 10 people who come out of prison go back within three years or are spending a fortune on something that's a total failure. The Supreme Court has said it's unconstitutional. We need to completely overhaul our system, people. someone who has been reforming the system from the outside for the last 20 years, and that's what I've been doing. I've worked for a lot of community and advocacy organizations, like Walden House, like Legal Services for Children, helping kids turn their lives around and stay in school and stay out of the criminal justice system. I've worked for criminal justice reform organizations like the National Council on Crime and Delinquency, the Haywood Burns Institute. The Burns Institute focuses on the overrepresentation of youth of color in our justice system and what we can do to make the system fairer for all youth. I've also worked in the mayor's office and on the police commission with law enforcement trying to modernize San Francisco law enforcement. And then I went to Berkeley. I founded the Berkeley Center for Criminal Justice with this mission to bring law enforcement and community together to build collaboration around reforming the criminal justice system. We need to work together. My whole campaign is about working with the community. And the medical cannabis community is a very important community in this city to be working with. I will sit down and listen to your concerns, and I will work with you on issues related to medical cannabis and other issues that you care about. And I can assure you that I will not be prosecuting anyone who is abiding by the laws of medical cannabis in this city. The sit lie law was also mentioned. I am someone who opposed the sit lie law because I don't think it makes us any safer. Guys, that's the word. So I don't want to take a whole lot more of your time, but uh, you know the election is now just a couple months away. I would really be honored to have your support and your vote on November 8th. If you want to reform the city, my name is David Onik. Thank you for asking again. My website is davidonik.com, D-A-V-I-D-O-N-E-K, David Onik. Remember that name. Vote on November 8th. If you want to change things, you've got to be able to vote. Again, we haven't ever had a DA who's come from community groups like I've come from community groups. Has there ever been a DA who worked at Walden House? No way. So we need to reform the system. We need to change it. And someone with my perspective can do that. Please work to get me elected and work with me when I'm DA to reform our broken criminal justice system. Thank you all very, very much.
vote is so important. The poor people's medical cannabis vote has changed San Francisco so many times over. And I want to make sure that everybody LGBT people get beaten up and nobody prosecutes the, the uh, people who beat them up and I hope that you know you will help and with Absolutely. I will take hate crimes very, very seriously. Uh, they're horrific uh, when they happen. We need to do everything we can to prevent hate crimes, first of all. Uh, and for those we can't prevent that do occur, we need to investigate and prosecute to the fullest extent of the law and that's exactly what I plan to do. Thank you very no much. First. I bless this in the spirit of the rhythm to share with everyone tonight. Yeah. They already did all that. I know, but just do it. Just to be sure. Exactly. Double check. So you're 40 years old. Yes, ma'am. I'm proud of it. And you, but if you tried to get 40 candles on there, remember in the house down. <laughs> yeah, I got. Stay, 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 stay. Wait, wait, wait. Come on, show the picture. Okay. There you go. Hey everybody, how's it going? Thanks for coming out. I'm candidate for district attorney, and I'm running for district attorney because our criminal justice system is completely broken. We have a situation where we're practically bankrupting the state because we're over-incarcerating so much. At the same time, seven out of ten people who come out of prison are back within three years. It's gotten so bad that the Supreme Court of the United States has said that it's unconstitutional. So we need to dramatically overhaul the system, we need to reform it. In order to do that, we need somebody who's been working from the outside to reform the system for the last few years. That's exactly what I've been doing. I started my career, uh, Chris was just talking about Walden House, I started at Walden House Adolescent Facility, counseling delinquent kids, helping them turn their lives around. Uh, after law school at Stanford, I worked at legal services for children, providing free legal services to low-income kids in the city, particularly kids who had been arrested at school. So, so I really started out in the community and advocacy world. I've also worked for some of the leading criminal justice reform organizations in the country, such as the National Council on Crime and Delinquency, where I really focused on alternatives to incarceration for juveniles, and the W. Haywood Burns Institute for Juvenile Justice, Fairness, and Equity, which focuses on the over-representation of youth of color in our juvenile justice system and what we can do to make the system fairer for all youth. From there, I moved into the Mayor's Office of Criminal Justice, where I ran juvenile justice programs for the city and then became the Deputy Director. Worked very closely with law enforcement, from the Sheriff's Department, to the Police Department, to the DA's Office, to the Probation Department. And later was appointed to the San Francisco Police Commission, which is a civilian oversight body of the Police Department. And in both of those positions, I took national best practices from around the country and brought them to local law enforcement here. I brought it all together at Berkeley Law School, where I founded the Berkeley Center for Criminal Justice with the mission of bringing law enforcement and community together to build collaboration around pragmatic criminal justice reforms. 
That's what I've been doing my whole career. That's what this campaign is about. We need to work collaboratively with the community. Let me give an example of that quickly from my career on the issue of getting jobs for people coming out of prison, which is a real issue in this city with realignment, with more prisoners on their way home, uh, and especially in the Tenderloin, where a lot of prisoners come. The number one thing we can do to help someone reintegrate is to help them get a job. But people face so many barriers coming out of prison and coming back to the communities and trying to get jobs. So we had a project that brought together the most diverse group of people you can possibly imagine. One third were law enforcement and corrections leaders, one third were community and advocacy leaders, and one third were employers. Because if you're talking about jobs, you need to have employers at the table. I brought them all together, everyone from the head of the prison guards union on one side to formerly incarcerated advocates who had spent 20 or more years behind bars themselves on the other side and was able to get consensus from this group on a range of reforms to help people get jobs coming out of prison. That's exactly the approach I'll take in the DA's office. Bring everyone to the table, particularly the community and other law enforcement agencies, and let's problem solve together on pragmatic solutions. Okay, the other thing I'm going to focus on is what works. And uh, let me talk about a couple things here. Uh, when I was in the mayor's office, I helped do a study of homicides and shootings in San Francisco that found that over 50% of the homicides and shootings occurred in less than 2% of the landmass of San Francisco. And you won't be surprised to know what the areas were. The Tenderloin, Biz Valley, Bayview, Western Edition, and the Mission had over 50% of the homicides and shootings in San Francisco, even though they were less than 2% of the landmass. As I moved into the police commission, with the police department, we helped develop the violence reduction initiative or the zone strategy that broke, uh, broke the 2% into the five zones, the five neighborhoods I just mentioned. We flooded both community and police resources to those areas. In 2009, because of a lot of hard work from people in the community and in law enforcement, homicides went down over 50% in San Francisco, which was the biggest one-year drop in the country. So when we focus on what works, following the data to guide our decision making, we can have a dramatic impact on crime. What else works, one minute, thank you, is uh, focusing on juveniles. And that's been one of the focus, uh, one of my focuses my entire career is working with juveniles and helping them turn their lives around. I'll make juvenile justice the top priority in my DA's office because every kid we can keep from going to the adult system makes our streets safer. That's the best investment we can make. I'm going to start a restorative justice program that brings victims and juvenile offenders together in the juvenile system. Victims love it. Uh, they have higher satisfaction ratings and offenders will reoffend much less often. Join my campaign. We have over 1,900 people from the Police Chiefs Association to uh, over 30 members of SFPD to members of the Board of Supervisors, six of the seven members of the school board, the teachers union, SEIU, Local 1021 just endorsed me. The list is huge from every neighborhood in the city, pages and pages of community and advocacy leaders from every part of the city. I thank you for your time, and I hope you'll join us. And I don't know if I have time for questions or not. No. Name? David Onik. Thanks. Thanks, folks. Appreciate it.